So why don't we go ahead and start? And um, I will welcome everybody again to the third session of the Santa Cruz Pickwick Club. Um, we are reading Bleak House. This is uh, the assignment for today is, uh, yes, is, is chapters 33 to 49. All right. And I'll remind you about our, our ground rule, which is that for purposes of discussion, we are not allowed to discuss anything that happens in the novel beyond chapter 30, uh, 49. Um, and uh, I, I, this, I, this is, I, I have been rereading this novel, which I know very, very well. Um, and I am just blown away with how, how wonderful it is. It, it gets better and better. And uh, we are now three quarters of the way through the novel and it will keep getting better as we uh, finish it for our next meeting, which will be in January. And so for January, the fourth Sunday of January, we will uh, talk about the entire novel. I, I have a lot that I wanna talk about uh, today in the sections that we are reading. And I've asked Courtney to prepare a couple of passages and a couple of illustrations that I want to discuss. But before I do that, I, I thought that it might be useful to ask you if you have, that is all of you, if you have topics that you would like to discuss from this section of the novel or really from uh, previous sections, and we could we could perhaps ask for comments or raise hands, and uh, I'll take notes and make a list of the things that people want to things that people, and I will try and weave those into the uh, conversation that I direct. So I I'm going to ask people to raise hand, I will uh, call on them and ask you briefly, to, it, it could be a topic, it could be a scene in the novel, it could be a character, it could be a theme or a motif, it could be a particular passage that you want to discuss. So, so let me just, just call on people and ask you very briefly to, to say that. So I'll start with, uh, with Kirk Davis uh, and you'll need to unmute. So Kirk. Yes, uh, Professor, I just have to say, when you read chapter 47, Joe's Will, and chapter 48, which is entitled Closing In, anyone that doesn't think Charles Dickens is a master and a genius doesn't understand the nature of literature. Those two things, those two chapters are so brilliantly drawn and completely different, showing his mastery of both the sentimental and the coldly logical and brutal, he's just, I just had to get it off my chest. 47 and 48 are two of the greatest chapters in any book I've ever read. And 49 is pretty darn good too, so. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Phyllis, Phyllis Oreck. Hi, um, this actually echoes some points you've been making um, along the way, but it suddenly really jumped out at me, uh, the different roles that people have, uh, whether they be parent or child, and I can tell that some people are changing roles, or roles are slipping back and forth um, as this goes on. And then the second thing is a, a, like a little footnote that um, I love Mercury, and I love allegory, and I've looked up some of the meanings of those words. And I think uh, I'm going to delve into that more. I don't, you don't need to, but if it strikes me as something that he made a point of using for some good reasons. So okay. that, that's it. Thank you, David Brunell. Um, neglected children. Neglected children, OK. Um, Glenna. Um, this is really inspired by the presentation by the guy who wrote uh, Artful Dickens, but the whole ex experiment with having two, you know, the, the third person and the first person narrative, changing tenses, 
and the way that that helps us understand the complexities of Esther Summerson's character. I just think it's extraordinary and I, I'm endlessly interested in that theme. And let me just say, I'm reading, uh, rereading a novel, The Tenderness of Wolves, which also has two different points of view. And in the um, notes to it, the author says, I felt emboldened to do this because of Bleak House. <laughs> um, Dickens is everywhere. Okay, Brad. Hello, everybody. Happy holidays. I had a question about how Dickens writes. And I wanted to know, I'm assuming you know, if when he begins a novel, he has the ending and everything in mind in sight. And is he writing to the ending or over the period of the year and a half that it takes him to write these novels? Is he going along and writing it as he goes, affected by the things that are happening in London or in England at the time? And is he changed and directed by those events? Or like I said, does he have the whole thing in his mind when he begins? Thank you. Or Good, good question, good question. Yes, Peggy, what would you like us to talk about? What I would like is to have more meetings <laughs> per book and to have them be a little longer because last time we pretty much had one subject, but we didn't exhaust it. And there are many more subjects and it's got lots of stuff in it. So I don't see any reason to rush through it in four sessions. I would like to have more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or we could do it, you know, every night at five o'clock instead of the news. <laughs> here, here. Okay, Sarah. Like for you, all you need to do is call Big Lou at <laughs> Yes, Sarah. Sarah. Will answer your call and what's going to turn my policy that you can afford. Yes, some someone has the, the radio on. Okay. It's, um, me. it's me. I'm sorry. Yeah. Let let me um tell those of you who are joining a little bit late. I'm taking a list of topics, anything that people would like to talk about, particularly in the section for today, um, but in the novel up to this point. And I will try and weave these into the, the discussion that I lead. So um, a scene, a character, a topic, a theme, a passage, anything that you would like to talk about. So um, Sita. Hi, I'm particularly um, taken in by Dickens' description and the action within the description of and the action within certain interiors. So, I love the shooting gallery and I uh, am captivated. I'm captivated by, well, the, um, the Bagnets, their home. And I'm sure there are many, there are many, many interiors. He doesn't mess around uh, mm -hmm. with describing the physicality of something which has so much, um, uh, so much of a character. The, the, the interiors are characters. Okay. And they, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, description of places, particularly of interiors. <laughs> interiors. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, Glenn has already spoken. Frank Condridge, do you have a, a topic you would like us to discuss? I, I'd like to see, uh, I, I, I've been wondering, wondering as we go through the novel, the, um, the interplay between Halbert, uh, Halbert Brown and, and Dickens and how they work together. The, the illustrations are just so uh, descriptive. There, there's so many layers to them. How, how closely did they work? How closely did Dickens um, uh, sort of direct um, fizz in, in, his, in, his, in his drawings. Okay, um, we can talk about that. So relationship between author and illustrator, Dickens and fizz. 
Um, Trudy. Trudy has stepped away. Patricia, Patricia no, Kovner. I'm, I'm, I'm still here. John, I'm still here, but um, and, I, don't, I don't know much about the illustrators. Sorry, can't help oh, you. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't see you on my screen, Trudy, and I apologize for that because there's another Trudy uh, in, in, the, in the class. <laughs> oh my goodness. So she's listed as Kathleen, but she, I know her as Trudy. Um, so um, anyway, uh, Trudy Bird, while I have you on screen, is there a topic or a theme that you would like us to discuss today? Can you give me a minute to think about that? Sure. Uh, okay, thanks. Trudy Hoffaker, Kathleen <laughs> by name. I, I'm, I'm here as a listener today. I've been living in a house totally torn up with a duct cleaning that has turned into replacing everything and anything in the house, including the shower. So <laughs> I'm just here to see people and listen to their ideas. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to take just one or two more and then um, launch into uh, the discussion, taking it through some of the topics that people have mentioned. But Nina, what, what, uh, what would you uh, like us to Patricia, do? you call them maybe four, John, Patricia. This is Patricia. Patricia yes, I'm, I'm sorry, Patricia. Yes. Uh, my question is about jaundice and jaundice <clears throat> i thought it was a law suit or a law case in which case it's usually something like jaundice versus jaundice roe yes. v wade i don't get how jaundice and jaundice is a law case i need that explained please okay okay Thank you. Th that's that's an interesting question and people often make the mistake of naming the lawsuit as jarndyce versus jarndyce, but it is correctly, as you say, it's jarndyce and jarndyce. So, uh, Nina. Uh, yeah, hi, um, I was just, um, I just really liked, I wanted to second the part about uh, Joe's, the, Joe's death. Um, I just because I thought the language was really great. And then the other part that I thought the language was really funny um, when he uh, describes it, um, basically any of the interactions between um, Mr. Rouncewell, um, the like the um, the uh, George's brother and um, and Sir Deadlock and how he kind of always talks about this guy as like a very like metallic person and uses a lot of metallic imagery. Um, I just think that's really hilarious and um, very like apt and a very like clever way of describing things. And the I just iron, like to talk about the language. <laughs> like the Iron Master, the iron, the iron Master. Yeah, like base oh, metals okay. and precious metals and okay. stuff, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna close off this part of the, no, I need to, to acknowledge Trudy because Trudy took a minute to, to think, Trudy Bird. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, John. And Nina, I, I agree that the language is always just stunning. But one thing that um, that I think about when I read Dickens, I think especially this particular book, is um, his uh, charity efforts with women, uh, fallen women, let's call them that. Um, he, he spent a lot of his money and time working in that area. And I am very concerned about how that works in with the whole question that was brought up, I think in the first session that I attended about um, mothering and, and fathering and how, um, how the lack of blessings of uh, church and governmental honor to a union between a man and a woman affects what happens later. I think that's terribly important. I don't know, I haven't thought about it for long. Well, I've thought about it for long, but I haven't thought about articulating it for long. But it's, it's a question that seems to work its way into every little corner and crevice of this novel. So thank you for taking my question. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm gonna um, 
I thank everyone for their contributions and I'll try and touch on as many of these, these topics as I can. Um, but the, the place that I want to begin, um, there, there are a couple of places that I want to start the discussion. One is to remind of two passages that uh, I've mentioned previously that I think are particularly important for this novel. And one is that, uh, that passage where the third person narrator, the omniscient or impersonal narrator says, what connection can there be between Joe the Crossing Sweeper and the mercury and powder? And that question about what connection can there be, um, I think is, is one that we always need to keep in mind as, as we read this novel. It, in a sense, it speaks to the, the question about um, whether Dickens knew from the beginning everything that was going to happen in this novel or whether he worked it out as he was writing and publishing it over the year and a half of the serial publication. Um, but we, as one in our discussion last month about detectives in the novel, one of the things that we said was that the reader is also a detective. And if we ask ourselves, what the reader is a detective of. There are many detectives in this novel who are characters who are trying to find out a secret of some kind or to solve a mystery. And if we think about the reader as a detective, what is the mystery or the secret that the reader is trying to uh, understand or discover or make clear? And I think that uh, we as, as readers, as detectives, are in one sense ahead of the detectives in the novel, that is the detectives who are characters, because they're all trying to figure out what connection there can be. Um, and the connection is uh, between Lady Dedlock and Esther, between Lady Dedlock and Hawden, who also uses the name Nemo. Um, uh, there, there are various secrets that, uh, that the detectives in them. But we as readers have already figured out most of those connections. It, it doesn't take very long, I think, for us to realize that Esther is the illegitimate daughter of Lady Dedlock, that Nemo Hawden uh, is her father, and that there was a, a, an illegitimate and extramarital relationship between Lady Dedlock uh, uh, when she was known as Honoria. But what is, what is the reader trying to figure out if the reader is uh, a, uh, a detective? And I think one of the, you know, trying to figure out happens next, and that certainly is true. But I think that we as readers are trying to figure out or trying to anticipate what will happen when the detectives inside the novel have solved the particular mystery that they are searching for. What will happen when Talkinghorn has figured out the connection between Lady Dedlock and Hawden uh, Nemo? Or what will happen when Lady Dedlock figures out that Esther is her daughter? Or what will happen when Esther realizes that Lady Dedlock is her mother? Those are the things I think that we are anticipating as, as we read. And we're trying to to, to, to anticipate where the story is going to go. In a sense, that's, that's you know, what will happen next. But uh, the second passage that I always come back to is that opening passage in chapter three, when Esther tells us about her doll. And um, the, the doll is so important in understanding this novel. I, I, I just will come back again and again to the doll. And one of the things that Esther tells us in the opening paragraph of, uh, of chapter three is that she uh, talks to her doll. And when she comes back from school, she tells the doll every one of her secrets. And it's kind of cute because we say, what secrets does, does a little girl have? In fact, Esther has secrets. She has secrets that she doesn't even know that she has. So, and I think it's important 
that when she says that, when she reports the way that she talks to her doll, it's not just one secret, it's many secrets. So I think there are many secrets that Esther has that she doesn't know that she has, uh, that, that we as readers are trying uh, or may not even know that we're trying to figure out, but there are many secrets in this novel. And as we read, more and more secrets will be revealed to us. So that's one point that I wanted to make. A second thing that I wanted to pursue as a, as a topic is that, uh, and I'm, I've mentioned this before, that Bleak House is, I think, a, a truly great novel. I agree with Kurt that anyone who says that, that Dickens is not a master of artistry is, uh, is, is simply, simply wrong. And the book, The Artful Dickens, is, uh, is I think a useful contribution to the understanding of Dickens's artistry. Um, but one way to think about the greatness of this novel is that it is at the same time a profound psychological novel, uh, a novel that anticipates in many way ideas or relationships or concepts that are part of depth psychology, of psychoanalysis. And I think that psychoanalytic thinking is very useful in understanding, particularly the situation of, uh, of Esther in, in this novel. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. But uh, the no it's a novel with two narrators. And we could say that uh, the Esther story is the psychological plot of the novel, but the section of the novel that is narrated by the other narrator, the third person narrator, is a public. Uh, uh, if Esther's is a private narrative, the other part of the novel narrated by the third person narrator is a public plot. It's a plot that has social and political and historical dimensions. And that's what I wanted to talk about just uh, for a little while this, uh, uh, this afternoon. In what ways is this an important social, political, and historical novel? And I think that um, uh, the, some of the things that people ha have mentioned, particularly the question of parenting, the question of neglected children, uh, um, perhaps even the question of illegitimacy or fallen woman, women. Um, uh, uh, we could say that Lady Dedlock is a fallen woman of, of a certain kind because she's the mother of an illegitimate child and has had an extramarital affair uh, uh, or a, an affair of sexual relationship prior to, to marrying the, the husband that she, that she has. So um, what are the great social themes? What are the great social questions? What is the, what, and, and there are also moral questions, I think. This is a novel that addresses important moral issues. And Dickens is, uh, I think we need to, to think of Dickens in a, uh, in a context of uh, uh, institutional religion. Dickens was a Christian and this is a novel that in addition to its examination of institutions like the law is examining the church as well. Uh, we haven't talked at all about Chad Band. Chad Band is one of the great minor characters in this novel. He's a, he's a comic figure, but he also touches on serious themes, I think, in the novel. What is the relationship of the church uh, to the social and moral and ethical questions that this novel raises. And I think the, the figure that we have talked least about, and some of you have raised this question indirectly, but I'll raise it directly, is Joe. Joe the Crossing Sweeper. And if you look at the illustrations to the novel, if you have an edition that has the illustrations, um, the, uh, the title page of the novel uh, has an illustration, and it's an illustration of Joe the Crossing Sweeper. And I think that position of prominence in the illustration is a way of pointing us to the great social themes of the novel. 
probably the, the most important social theme, I would say, is not exactly the law. This is, you know, of course, Dickens is, is satirizing the law in the case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce. Um, I'll, I'll comment on that title. Uh, Jarndyce versus Jarndyce would be the usual way that a, a law case would be presented. Jarndyce and Jarndyce indicates that it's an endless suit. For me, that Jarndyce and Jarndyce means that there will be a jar, you know, there was Tom Jarndyce who was the original Jarndyce, and now it's John Jarndyce. And there are more Jarndyces in the world who will be drawn into this. And will Jarndyce and Jarndyce ever end? Jarndyce versus Jarndyce, I think, would imply a, a final judgment of the kind that um, Miss Flight is anticipating. But will there ever be a final judgment to Jarndyce and Jarndyce? I think the, the substitution of and instead of versus indicates that this is an endless lawsuit that will never come to any kind of, of conclusion. But anyway, I, I think that although this is a great novel about the law and a satire on the law, that there's a larger question behind that, which is the question of justice. I think that this is a novel about justice. And justice is understandably a part of of the law. The law is supposed to uh, render judgments that are judgments in accord with the principles of justice. But there's a larger question of justice in this novel, and it's the question of social justice. And in addition to the lawsuit of Jarndyce and Jarndyce, there are two other lawsuits or two other places in the novel. They're not really different lawsuits, but there are two other places where the law comes in, maybe three. One is, is Talking Horn. We haven't talked much about Talking Horn. Talking Horn is a lawyer. Um, he's a solicitor, and uh, he's in the employ of the Deadlock family, but he also has motives of his own. So we need to pay attention to Jarndyce and think about Jarn uh, to Talking Horn and think about Talking Horn as uh, a representative of the law. Guppy is also a representative of, of, of the law. Guppy is one of my favorite characters in the novel, and he's sort of an apprentice uh, lawyer. He's a he's a wannabe uh, uh, lawyer who talks in legal jargon. Um, but there, there are a couple of other places where the law, I think, is implicated. Um, one is in the inquest. You remember the inquest uh, that takes place after the death of Hawden Nemo. And the inquest is a legal procedure that is whose aim is to determine the cause of death. It's a fairly simple process. And the title of the chapter uh, in which the inquest is presented is called Our Dear Brother. And the principal moment for me in the inquest scene, which is largely a kind of comic uh, scene because uh, um, they, they're not really able to uh, get much information about Hod and Nemo. But the principal moment in it is when Joe is called to testify. And Joe is not allowed to testify at the inquest because he's illiterate and they dismiss Joe. They tell Joe that he's not allowed to participate in the legal process. So that for me is a great injustice. The law refuses to acknowledge Joe, refuses to acknowledge him as having standing in a, in a court of law, refuses to acknowledge him as a person. And that refusal to acknowledge Joe is, I think, one of the great injustices in this novel. The title of that chapter, Our Dear Brother, um, is the place where I think Dickens's Christian um, background and Christian reference comes in because our dear brother is a, is a term that comes out of religious parlance, Christian parlance in, in, in particular. 
And you may remember that when Chad Ban speaks, Chad Ban gives a, a sermon and he takes Joe as the subject of his, his, his sermon. And essentially his sermon is another way of excluding Joe, of, of treating Joe as a non-person. But our dear brother reminds us of an important passage in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it's, it's the question that uh, Cain asks after Cain has murdered his brother Abel. And uh, God comes to, a to Cain and says, where is Abel? And Cain's answer is, am I my brother's keeper? And I think that the question of, am I my brother's keeper of social responsibility, of the willingness to be my brother's keeper, of acknowledgement of your, your uh, responsibility toward even the, the poorest and more abject members of society is a, a crucial public theme in the novel. And uh, it's, it's one of the places where Dickens engages with both the law and with Christian doctrine and, uh, and puts that really at the center of the novel. So I see a hand up from Michael. So would you like to comment, Michael? Yeah, um, the other thing about the title, Our Dear Brother is used in funeral, or, uh, usually by people who know the deceased. And um, uh, um, yes. Nemo dies of starvation, and yet he's our dear brother. He's the, he's the un, and again, unacknowledged relations are central to the novel. And I think the title goes to the whole, you know, when Joe dies, his last will, the last thing he's talking about is how the doctrinal disputation overtake any charity that might have been given to him. And, and Nemo dies of starvation, um, our dear brother, who is excluded from the human. So I think that's the other resonance of that title. Yes, um, both excellent points. And so, yes, we need to bring this then back to the death of Joe, chapter 48 uh, of, of the novel that was pointed out by Kirk in the, uh, at, the, at the very beginning, that Joe is the unacknowledged other. And he dies in the middle of, uh, of reciting the, the Lord's Prayer. And um, it's, it's a moment where the omniscient narrator, where the third person impersonal narrator gets most angry and most vehemently uh, crit critical of, uh, of lords and ladies, uh, honorable this and that. It's a, it's a, it's a passage uh, that is, is unforgettable in this novel. It's one of the most powerful uh, speeches that the, the narrator makes. But um, um, the, the other side to that, and, and a place where uh, a different kind of judgment is being passed is who are the people in the novel who acknowledge and recognize Joe? And one of them is Nemo that Nemo Hawden, uh, someone who dies of starvation and of, of opium addiction, uh, 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 essentially of poverty, uh, is able to share what little he has with Joe. And Joe is the one who pronounces the epitaph for Nemo. He was very good to me, he was. And those are some of the most powerful and touching words in, in this novel. That's the acknowledgement of true brotherhood. Uh, uh, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes, if you are kind to Joe. Being kind to Joe, sharing what you have with Joe, acknowledging Joe as a person, acknowledging the homeless person in the street that would pass by. Uh, acknowledging our common humanity. This, I think, is one of the great, the truly great public themes of, of this novel. And one of the things that we can ask is who else is kind to Joe? Is there anyone else in the novel who is kind to Joe? So Nina raises, raises a hand. Nina, speak. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I don't really know if 
so the the other um two ladies like Liz and um I can't remember her sister's name um but they're kind of like in the same class but the one I wanted to um point out was sort of like Mr. Snagsby because I thought that he was sort of like a bridge between the two worlds where like he his gut is like I should feel bad and there should be humanity uh you know or I should respect this person's humanity but I can't show anyone that I'm doing this or I have to do it really secretly so I thought that was kind of interesting and sort of you know like kind of um I don't know similar to a lot of how people act today (laughs) in giving out charity and stuff you know Um, yes um, we, we, we could say uh, another way to, to, uh, to frame the question of the, uh, what is the great moral issue of this novel is charity. Um, and we have the satire on charity at the beginning with the visiting ladies, Mrs. Pardigal and Mrs. Jellybee. We have the entire chapter called telescopic philanthropy, which is care about uh, um, uh, the natives in Africa, uh, as Mrs. Jellybee does, but uh, neglect your children at home and neglect the poor uh, who live among you. So charity, the failure of charity uh, is exemplified in many points in, in this novel. Um, but Mr. Snagsby, as you point out, is a, is a wonderful a counter example because Mr. Mr. Snagsby is constantly shedding half crowns. Uh, he, 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 every time he sees Joe, he gives Joe uh, uh, a, a coin. And of course, uh, the joke connected with this is that uh, Mrs. Snagsby, whom we talked about last time, is one of the detectives in the novel. She's a comic detective. But what she believes is that. Uh, Mr. Snagsby's caring for Joe is not a sign of Christian charity, but a sign that uh, Joe is his illegitimate son. So Mrs. Snagsby is uh, on the wrong track. She has a conspiracy theory. I think uh, you you called it last time, Nina. Um, um, uh, But the other uh, people who are kind to Joe are the brickmakers the two brickmakers' wives who, who take Joe in. Joe, Joe uh, they help to shelter Joe. So one of the things that we will notice in this, in this novel is that, um, and, and that, that there is a, a, a solidarity among members of the lowest classes. Joe, it, it, this is a novel about social class. One of the ways in which it is a, a magnificent novel is the range of social class that it refers to from the deadlock aristocracy through various uh, levels of the professional and middle classes down to shopkeepers like Mr. Snagsby, down to the brickmakers, the working class, and finally down to Joe, who's a member of what we would today call the underclass. What, What class is Joe? Joe is Joe is sort of fallen out of the social class system. He's 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 at the very bottom of the social class system, and yet Joe has one thing that he can offer, and uh, in response to uh, the kindness that he receives from Nemo, he was very good to me. He was. Uh, Joe has one thing to offer in response to, uh, to, to Nemo, and that is he takes his broom and he sweeps the step of the graveyard where Nemo is buried. The only thing that Joe has to offer is his labor. Joe is, that's Joe's job in the world. It, it's not quite, Joe is not a beggar. What Joe does, I I hope you understand what a crossing sweeper is. The streets of London are muddy. And when a member of the middle class or the upper classes wants to cross the street without getting muddy, Joe will sweep the mud out of the way, allowing a clean passageway across the muddy street. Remember all the mud and mire in the London streets in 
the opening paragraph of, of the novel. Um, and then if he's lucky, Joe will get a tip. So he's not a beggar. It's important to, to emphasize that Joe is not begging for money. He's doing a fair exchange of his labor for, uh, for payment. Um, and when, when Nemo dies and Nemo has been kind to Joe, he gives him that one thing that he has to offer, which is his labor, not is uh, in hopes that Nemo will, will compensate him, Nemo is dead, but as a way of paying back the debt that he feels toward, toward Nemo. So a couple of hands, Peggy. Uh, yeah. Um, there's a whole other novel here that needs to be written about <laughs> Lady Deadlock and Nemo. Because how did that happen? And then she ends up being Lady Deadlock, you know? And so the, there's a, a class division between the very, very rich and they get to do whatever they want and the poor that are struggling. And we're seeing that now, massively we're seeing it. And we're also seeing it in the courts because the, the courts things that are happening lately Except for one, you know, if you're a rich white person, you can shoot people and it's fine. And if you're black, you're not. And so there's the same division kind of thing. But I don't know how Lady Deadlock and Nemo and Esther came to be. So somebody for a thesis should just write that novel. <laughs> Thanks for those connections to relevant court cases that have been in the news of late, Peggy. Um, one, you know, what connection can there be between Joe the Crossing Sweeper and Lady Deadlock? We could phrase the question that way. The mercury and powder is um, the servant to the aristocracy. Uh, yeah. Uh, Lady Deadlock engages Joe, uh, hires him in effect to take her to the graveyard to show her the place where Nemo, the lover and father of her, her child, uh, is, is buried. And um, what does Lady Deadlock do? She gives him a gold sovereign. Think about the difference between a gold sovereign and the, um, uh, uh, the, the coin the small coin that uh, uh, Mr. Snagsby gives to Joe. The gold sovereign that Lady Deadlock gives him is of almost no use to Joe because for him, a gold sovereign, no, no one can believe that Joe could possibly own a gold sovereign. So he can't make use of it. It's, it's a useless payment. And if you look closely at that, at that passage, Lady Deadlock never thanks Joe. She gives him the gold sovereign and then disappears. And the failure to thank him is I think an indication of the failure to recognize him as a person. She thinks of him only as someone that she can buy off and dismiss without acknowledging, without recognizing, as a, uh, recognizing him as a, as a, yeah. as a person. Um, how does Lady Deadlock know about Joe? How does she know that he exists? It's because um, his, he, he is described in the newspapers as someone who appeared at the inquest. So that's, a, that's the connection. It's through the popular press. Uh, there are reporters who were at the, uh, at the inquest who wrote about Joe who didn't uh, was not permitted to testify in the case. David, you have a hand up. On the religious front, um, yes. I think if you asked Dickens what the most important Bible text in his mind is through this book, it would be one which is in two of the synoptic gospels love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus says there are two, only two really important commands, and that's one of them. And this is the difference between the people who operate on that 
in the book and those who don't recognize others as human is a real uh, broad line dividing them since Peggy brought current events, I would say that an enormous number of our politicians who identify themselves as very religious, particularly at election time, don't seem to have paying attention to that text. Chad Bend is alive and well in these days. Um, Brad. Yes, you have your hand up. Just a quick question to follow up on one of your statements. If charity is the frame of the novel, which I think we probably could all recognize and agree to that, what insight do you think Dickens brings us to about charity? If you, if you look at the macro issue, one side would say, well, that half of the characters would suggest that charity is essential to our lives and our community and our world. And the other half of the characters as the other half of the world dismisses it as distrustful, as unessential, as something to suspect in their religion, in their politics, et cetera. What, what, what insight do you think Dickens in the end offers us to that frame if he's gonna raise that question? Um, I, I would uh, not try to give a conclusive answer because I think Dickens realizes the complexity of, of the issue. Um, and to that end, I would, I would point to the figure of John Jarndyce because we might say that Jarndyce is an example of someone who practices charity. Look at what he has done for Esther. He has taken Esther uh, under his guardianship and he seems to be a generous person in, in other respects. Perhaps one of the few admirable members of the upper classes in, in, in this novel, though we'll have to investigate even that assertion um, further. Jardis's charity is suspect in this novel. Um, Jardis, Jardis, I think, complicates the question of charity because if you look at his relationship with um, Skimpole, Jardis is vulnerable. Jardis is someone who directs a large portion of his charitable efforts to an individual who, as best we can discern, is undeserving of it. Um, and there may be a selfish element in Jarndyce's charity. There may even be, as it I think turns out to be the case, that there's a selfish element in his charitable efforts toward Esther. Because later on, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, Jarndyce proposes marriage to Esther. Uh, and, um, you know, I should I should ask what people think about the proposal of, of marriage, but there, one could say that there's an element of selfishness in even what seems to be the most principal form of of charity in the novel. So I think Dickens is is um, and Dickens him, himself was besieged by people who wanted him as a famous author to support and contribute money to various charities. And he complains in his letters about the uh, dunning letters that he received from people who wanted him to give money. And he, re he resented uh, people who asked him to, to sponsor various causes. But he was himself very charitable. In, in the causes, uh, the home for, uh, for fallen women that he was involved in. And he was uh, um, an advisor to Miss Coots, the, um, uh, the uh, heiress who was involved in, in various uh, philanthropic endeavors. So I think Dickens has a complicated view of, of charity. I think that he, he, he uh, in this novel, is very much concerned with uh, authenticity of unselfish charity or 
unselfish, char charity of the kind that is exchanged between Nemo and Joe, where neither stands to gain anything from the, from the efforts. It, it, it seems to, to come from an authentic sense of uh, recognition. Um, so that, that's by way of an answer. So Jennifer and then Glenna and then William, I have other things I want to get on to, but um, uh, let's, let's stick with this. So Jennifer, Glenna, and William. So I'm thinking not, not as much about the transactional nature of so many of these relationships we've touched on, but of the relationships in which it's nothing but a transaction. So for example, how you mentioned Lady Deadlock doesn't thank Joe, but she gives him money. Um, Mrs. Jellybee, is coordinating all these fundraising efforts for people in Africa, she doesn't have to see them or address them or hear from them or listen to what they actually need. She can just impose herself and her money on it and tell herself she's doing a good thing because that's what all of us who have been raised in capitalist societies are basically told is that money is how we value things and how we value labor and how we value each other. And um, I am very suspicious of Jarndyce. I'll confess, I have not read this novel before. I'm having a heck of a time staying, not getting ahead of things. But like, I think from the beginning, I've been very aware of Esther's vulnerability. And so when it comes out that Jarndyce is going to basically foster her or adopt her or bring her in under his care, I'm just thinking like for how many young women who didn't have any money, is this a really, really bad idea because they really have no alternative. Um, and I found the timing of his proposal suspicious. Maybe I'm being a little paranoid about that, but that is what I think. And then I also just want to- Wait, like, wait, this, why, 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 why do you find the timing suspicious? Because didn't she, and again, like, I don't know if I'm remembering correctly or if I read that part correctly, but doesn't she go to him and tell him everything, including her lineage? And then after that, he comes back with a proposal. So I don't know if he's seeing some advantage to himself there in linking himself in matrimony with somebody I just, I don't know. And I, I feel like I should stop talking about that now because I really have no context for this novel. And so I'll, I'll stop there. But I also just want to bring up in this whole transactional thing, the small weeds. And the elder small weed is so reprehensible. And I wish I could not picture Mr. Burns from The Simpsons every time I read a scene that Mr. Smallweed is in, but how He's always after the money and he's always going after people using money, you know, going after George and how George is indebted to him. He's perfectly willing to destroy this whole other family that has signed for George. And uh, again, the, the lack of humanity that is so easy to have flourish when people stop seeing anything but money and the potential for some sort of profit or some sort of financial gain. All uh, excellent points. Um, those who are suspicious of, of Jarndyce um, often point to the first meeting between him and Esther in the coach in which he offers her uh, a pie. And she says, the pie is too rich for me. And he throws it out the window. Um, and um, you're muted, so I couldn't hear you. You were saying something, uh, Jennifer. But uh, is is Jarnd is Jarndis, does does Jarndis start buying Esther? Is there something transactional from the first meeting between Jarndis and Esther? Um, anyway, uh, I, I I'm I'm going to go on. So Glenna, next next. Uh, well, in in. Uh keeping with what we've been talking about, various biblical references, I'm thinking of um, the passage, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich man to get into paradise. So the most pure charity in this novel is the widow's mite, again from the Bible, where one relatively poorly off person gives to another relatively poorly off person. And, but I, I don't wanna to be too hard on John Jarndyce because 
I think that he falls for Esther when he sees her in action. I don't think he starts, that's my take anyhow. And one other thing I won't elaborate because in the interest of time, but I have met, one reason that I'm, I find Mrs. Jellybee to be so interesting in this novel, I have, I actually rented a room from a real life Mrs. Jellybee. And um, this woman was completely devoted to anti-nukes, but was cruel to the pets in her own house. <laughs> and so um, anyhow, I take her seriously. Okay, thank you, thank you. William. It seems in this novel, um, as, to, as to charity, uh, Dickens has the same problem that he had way back in Pickwick, in a world so unjust that you can have places like Tom All Alone's, and in a world where the people who do real hard physical labor, like the bricklayers live in such wretched hovels, uh, in so unjust a world, Dickens finds he can't trust institutions, uh, as he shows again and again. He also, is, he also shows us uh, the gaping moral holes in any kind of programmatic helping of the poor. We see that in Mrs. Pardiggle and in Mrs. Jellybee. There's no authenticity there, as you yourself mentioned. So all we're left with is the philanthropy that comes from the private pockets and out of the heart of individuals, which is never enough really to solve the problem, to put people on a right footing um, and 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 live um, comfortable and for the and the really for the really wretched to live comfortable lives it's really just a kind of person meeting person in the moment and it is at best a kind of solve rather than a, than a real social solution one of the um, criticisms that was made of Dickens as a social reformer uh, or as a novelist of social reform during his lifetime was that he was good at pointing out problems but not very good at coming up with solutions. And I think that, that there's, there's some accuracy to that criticism, but it's not a criticism so much as it is an accuracy in the, uh, understanding of the actual situation in which people live and continue to live today. That institutional solutions are not available or inadequate for dealing with the social problems that, um, that Dickens describes. Certainly the church, certainly the, the law courts are inadequate. Um, uh, organized charity is inadequate. And the best that can be achieved is, it was very good to me. Um, uh, David, you have your hand up. On the subject of jarndice, I agree with the statement that he decides he loves Esther after seeing her over a period of time in action. The moment at which he proposes is just after her illness and her altered appearance. Now, whether before that he was aware that she was interested in Alan Woodcourt I think he may have been, but part of the thought in his mind as an older man proposing to her was mm -hmm. that because her appearance had changed, that this might be her only chance. Yes, and um, I think that the timing of his proposal is uh, uh, is very relevant and that it's, it's not that he thinks there is any advantage to him in her connection to Lady Dedlock because he recognizes that 
as the illegitimate child that Lady Dednock will never recognize that there's, and, and he, 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 he doesn't need to, his selfishness is not transactional in, uh, in being motivated by status or by money. Um, but he, he, as an older man, is not a, he's not a lover. His, his, uh, his proposal is not a statement of love. It's, it's, it's a kind of formal <laughs> uh, proposition. Uh, and after Esther reads it and decides that she will agree to accept the, the proposal, uh, Esther goes back and cries uh, because she doesn't love Jarndyce, but she's so indebted to him that she Jarndyce's generosity, if we, if we think of, of Jarndyce's proposal as another indication of his generosity, we, um, I think, are mistaken because uh, it, it, it is a selfish um, gesture. And it's a gesture that comes not from passion, uh, but uh, it, it has a transactional dimension in that now that Esther, Esther's beauty has disappeared, uh, he feels that since no one else wants her, Guppy has, has rejected her at this point. Um, that he's, he's, he, he can now ask for her hand. So Moira, and then I'm gonna switch directions in just a second and, and go towards something else. So. Okay, I just, I just think that the whole um, relationship is creepy. Uh, they have that, they call her, what is it? Miss Dame, Dame, Dame Durden. What the hell is that about? You know, they all have these little bizarre pet names for her. And, um, I, you know, and Guppy, I, there's no question of, of she and Guppy. She rejected him a long time ago. Um, and then she still calls Jarndyce a uh, guardian at, after they're engaged. She yeah. can't even bring, him, bring herself to call him by his name. And I'm thinking he's just getting a free housekeeper. <laughs> He's thinking she's not going anywhere else. I've got a free housekeeper. Yeah, that's me. Okay, um, I'm I'm going to switch directions now and and go. Uh, we've we've talked about charity. We've 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 talked about the the social themes. We've talked about the the Christian dimension. We've talked about the inadequacy of organized religion and organized charity. I want to go in the direction now of the psychological and go back to Esther and and um, and I want to um, uh, ask Courtney uh, or Jillian, who are my assistants in the background, to put up the passage from chapter 31. This is a passage that uh, uh, is a very puzzling passage that I want to read aloud to you and, uh, and ask what you think about. And I, I hope that that passage, Courtney, do you, do you have that passage? Jillian, do you have that passage uh, ready to show? This is, uh, yes, thank you. This is the passage. Um, this is a, it's a very puzzling passage from chapter 31, which is uh, the chapter in which Esther becomes ill. And let me read the passage first to you and then ask you what you think is going on here. I had no thought that night, none, I am quite sure, of what was soon to happen to me. But I have always remembered since that when we had stopped at the garden gate to look up at the sky, and when we went upon our way, I had for a moment an undefinable impression of myself as being something different from what I then was. 
I know it was then and there that I had it. I have ever since connected the feeling with that spot and time and with everything associated with that spot and time to the distant voices in the town, the barking of a dog and the sound of wheels coming down the miry hill. Now, this is before Esther becomes ill. And one way to understand this passage is that she, she has a, a, an intuition uh, that something is changing. I had for a moment an undefinable impression of myself as being something different from what I then was. So one way to understand this is that she has a premonition of the illness that she may already have contracted and that will change her life because it will disfigure her. Um, but it's still a very puzzling passage. And I, I, I'll, I'll toss out an idea that I have about this because um, if, if you accept what I'm about to propose, then it makes sense of things that happen later in the novel. Remember, this is, this is in monthly number 10, which is the same, uh, it's, it's halfway through the novel. It's uh, and in the structure of Dickens' 19 or 20 part novels. Uh, monthly number 10 is exactly halfway through and it, it's always a, a kind of climax. And in chapter 32, which is the appointed time, Crook spontaneously combusts. And we haven't talked at all about spontaneous combustion in this novel. Um, uh, so if this is a climactic moment in the novel, Esther is becoming ill, Crook is spontaneously combusting, is there any connection between what's happening to Crook and what's happening to Esther at this climactic point in the novel. I've always remembered since that when we had stopped at the garden gate to look up at the sky and when we went upon our way, I had for a moment an undefinable impression of myself as being something different from what I then was. What's going on with Esther here? What, what is, it's, a, it, it's a description of a realization that she's a different person from who she was. Does anybody have any ideas uh, about this? And I, I can't see uh, the, um, I, I, I think you can take the passage off the screen now and, and come back. Does anybody have any, any ideas about what's going on with Esther at this point? Brad? You know, when I, when I first read that, I thought, with reference to the sky and the light in the distance and the sounds far away, they all seem to be references to the greater world at large, to the greater creation of which she is a part. And I, I believe there is generally and usually a point in time where a person realizes the life is just not them by themselves, but they're part of a greater sweep of time, a greater sweep of, of life, of society, of the world, that they're just a piece in a greater puzzle. And, and I, I got the sense that perhaps she began to see the world working at large for the first time in, a, in, a, in an interesting or macro way that, that she found that she might play a part in. Mm -hmm. Interesting suggestions. In, in the way that you're, you're describing that realization, it's a, it's a more cosmic understanding of the relationship between self and, and universe, not self and immediate environment, but self and, and the larger uh, sphere of, of existence. Well, well consequently, the universe and also as a part of that, the, the immediate world of which you're a part of. Okay. When, you real, when you realize there is good and evil in the world and that your ability to affect it may not be as hopeful as you maybe perhaps once thought, for example. Okay. So let me take Nina and then Phyllis. 
Uh, yeah, so I was thinking that two things. One is that, I mean, this happens like kind of right before she, well, I guess Charlie gets really sick and then she gets really sick. Yeah. Um, but so like, I think if you don't remember a lot during your illness, there might be something like right before your illness that you just, there just really stands out in your mind because that's like the last thing you can remember actually very clearly uh, before you actually got sick. Um, but the second thing is also maybe it's like a transition because right before that, um, uh, Caddy gets married. Um, and so I was thinking when you were talking about the whole like acts of charity and how, for example, um, the only person who was charitable to Joe was like Nemo. And then the only thing that he could provide for Nemo, like in, in payment of that was um, like him cleaning his grave. Cause that's like what he does. So for Esther, right? Like how, what, how can she give charity? And one way I would, was thinking that she can give charities just because she doesn't have any money or anything, but um, she can give her services and sort of like acting as a mentor slash mother figure to Caddy. Um, but then this chapter kind of closes for her um, because now Caddy's married, I guess, and kind of like can, she's like, you know, starting her own life. Um, and so now this is like her transition to a, like another act of charity, um, which uh, could, I, I don't know if this is a really big stretch, but basically that she does end up later, like um, now with her, you know, bigger worldview, uh, know that an act of charity she can do is like give up wood court for Jarndus when he does ask her. <laughs> I don't know if that okay. makes a lot of sense. Okay, but that was, okay. I'm gonna take like a, a couple, of, couple of more uh, responses and then um, say some more myself. So Phyllis and then Michael. Okay, this is a little bit um, on a slightly different thing. The um, the end of chapter 30 um, has uh, Esther saying, it is a long time ago, I must write it even if I rub it out again, because it gives me so much pleasure. And uh, maybe my antennae were more heightened the second time through in, in this particular series of chapters, but more and more I hear Esther letting us know that she's not telling us everything. Um, it, she talks in chapter 43, um, number 14, about it matters little now how much I thought of my living mother. Well, when are you writing this? Um, my mother's letter, I haven't, I would have told him all my mother's letter then, but he would not hear it. Then, is she going to do it some other time? This starts to keep coming up, and I know it's not exactly what you're talking about, but I feel as if, um, uh, Esther is someone we don't know uh, by the end of the book, um, and yeah, we, we can't we can't talk about the end of the book. But I think I think you point to something very useful in this. We, one, two things. One is that we need to remember that this is a retrospective narrative. That Esther is writing this from some point later than all of the events that have happened to her in her life. And we need to keep that double perspective in mind always as we read, that there's Esther the character, and then there's Esther the narrator who is telling us about what she felt at a given moment. And, and does that make her an unreliable narrator? narrator? Yeah. And also in what you were talking about earlier, what are we trying to find out? And do we, we have access to information yes. that the characters don't, or does she have access to and to, to, to ask about unreliability is to open a complicated uh, Pandora's box. Um, um, and in a sense, all narrators are unreliable. Um, and it may be that Esther doesn't fully understand what she is telling us or that she didn't understand it at the time that she experienced it. Um, and she may be struggling now as a narrator to understand things that happened to her earlier in her life. So again, that, that double perspective. And it, if, if Esther is, is unreliable, it, it may be because she isn't telling us everything but not telling us because she's deliberately concealing so much as that she doesn't fully understand uh, either then 
or even now in, in the telling of, of this. Um, and in this passage, this very puzzling passage that I, I just showed to you, she doesn't tell us everything. She says, I had the impression that I was somehow different from what I was before, but she doesn't say how she's different. She just knows that she's different and she knows when and where she had that realization, but she doesn't explain what it was. So Michael. Uh, yeah, but I think this is where psychoanalytic kinds of approaches come into play. Immediately after that passage, she goes to the brick maker's cottage and there's Joe. Joe just takes her for her mother. And this comes right after the chapter, the end of the previous chapter, where uh, Lady Dedlock realizes that this that um, Esther is her daughter. Esther doesn't know that yet, but I mean, Joe thinks she is Lady Dedlock, and it's that that identity. That, that, and and then he says, "You're going to take me to the burying ground, which is, of course, where all their paths ultimately converge: her mother, Nemo, Joe, and her." And that's what I think is being foreshadowed in the passage that you met. It's the return of the repressed, the way that the psychoanalytic process gradually brings to consciousness the things that are repressed. And in the text of this novel, those are some of the repressed things. It's the, what are the relations between how do these things connect? And Esther is going to be a different person because she will become Lady Dedlock's daughter in her own consciousness, as well as in fact. I think, um, thank you, because that's very much the direction in which I, I want to propose that we understand this passage. I think this is the moment where Esther realizes who her mother is. I think this, she can't articulate because it's, uh, the, the, it's, it's an unconscious realization. She hasn't quite brought it into consciousness. It's something that um, there's, there's a very nice phrase that, that a, a psychoanalyst whose work I read uses to talk about things that are known but not thought. It's the unthought known that Esther realizes at this moment without being able fully to articulate it. Because she's seen Lady Dedlock, she's seen her in church, she's seen Lady Dedlock's face, she, she, which is her face, her, her face and Lady Dedlock. Every, other people recognize that uh, <laughs> the, the facial resemblance between them. Um, in, in this passage uh, or in this chapter, uh, Esther turns to Charlie. Remember, Nina pointed out that, that uh, Esther contracts the illness from Charlie and she turns to Charlie and says, may I tell you a secret? And Charlie says, yes. And, she, she's, and then Esther says, Charlie could recognize the secret in my face. And what that means is, that, I mean, the secret that Esther is referring to is that she has contracted the illness, that Charlie can see in Esther's face the signs of the illness that, that Esther is about to manifest. But the secret in my face is that other secret of the connection between Esther and Lady Dedlock. So if this is the moment where Esther unconsciously recognizes who her mother is without fully being able to know that consciously, to, it's, it's an unconscious knowledge that is at the threshold of, of consciousness. I think this explains one of the real puzzles of the novel, which is why does Esther become disfigured and no one else who contracts the illness is disfigured. I think Esther is disfigured because she consciously wishes or unconsciously wishes to disfigure herself as an act of charity perhaps toward Lady Dedlock whom she wants to protect. And the connection that I see between spontaneous combustion and what happens to Esther is that Esther spontaneously combusts. Esther disfigures herself. 
in order to destroy the evidence that would link her to Lady Deadlock and therefore ruin Lady, Lady Deadlock's life. You remember the passage that we talked about last time where Lady Deadlock sees Esther at the Keeper's Lodge and says, is it not dangerous to sit in such an exposed place? If Esther has that thought unconsciously or at the threshold of consciousness that she is dangerous to Lady Deadlock because if people recognize the facial resemblance between them, Lady Deadlock's position as Lady Deadlock, as the, uh, the height of the fashionable world in the world of the aristocracy is forever doomed. So Esther disfigures herself unconsciously, a form of spontaneous combustion. And only later does Lady Deadlock come and um, confess that she is Esther's mother. But I want uh, Jillian and, and Courtney, for you please to put the second passage up, the passage from chapter 36, which is the chapter uh, in which um, Lady Deadlock reveals to Esther that she is Esther's mother. So <clears throat> this, this is a fairly long passage um, and it will be on two screens. And you remember, uh, uh, yes, uh, that Lady Deadlock gives Esther a letter and Esther takes the letter back to her room, safe in my own room. I read the letter. I clearly derived from it. And that was much then that I had not been abandoned by my mother, my, by my mother. Her elder and only sister, the godmother of my childhood, discovering signs of life in me when I had been laid aside as dead, had in her stern sense of duty, with no desire or willingness that I should live, reared me in rigid secrecy and had never again beheld my mother's face from within a few hours of my birth. So strangely did I hold my place in this world that until within a short time back, I had never, to my own mother's knowledge, breathed, had been buried, had never been endowed with life, had never borne a name. When she had first seen me in the church, she had been startled and had thought of what would have been like me if it had ever lived and had lived on. But that was all then. Next, next passage. What's more the letter, what more the letter told me needs not to be repeated here. It has its own times and places. My mother written to consume even its ashes. I hope it may not appear very unnatural or bad in me that I then became heavily sorrowful to think I had ever been reared, that I felt as if I knew it would have been better and happier for many people if indeed I had never breathed, that I had a terror of myself as the danger and the possible disgrace of my own mother and of a proud family name, that I was so confused and shaken as to be possessed by a belief that it was right and had been intended that I should die in my birth and that it was wrong and not intended that I should be then alive. This is the letter that Lady Deadlock writes, and, and you can take the passage off, off of the screen now. Um, this, is the, the, this is the revelation to Esther of the story of Esther's birth. Remember that Esther's, if we think of Esther as a detective, Esther, um, Esther's earliest question as a, as a reluctant detective was, did, my ma did mama die on my birthday? And the answer, one answer to that question is no, 
because my mother is still alive. But another answer to that question is that Esther died on her birthday. And I think the difficult secret that Esther carries is that Esther is dead. Esther is psychically dead. And she's dead, not physically, I don't, I don't mean that in a literal sense, but Esther believes that she had no right to live. And she even says that she was buried. I think that takes us back to the doll. Esther's action of burying the doll is Esther's unconscious reenactment of the fantasy that she has that when she was born, her mother did not want her, did not love her, rejected her, and killed her and buried her, that Esther died at that moment. And when Esther is burying the doll, she is enacting the role of her mother who rejected that daughter. Remember the scene with Hortense and Rosa in which Lady Dedlock rejects um, uh, Hortense and uh, says, no child speaking to Rosa, I want you. Esther is in the position of the rejected daughter and um, Esther, from this point on, um, uh, becomes the ghost. What is a ghost? Ghosts, we need to talk about ghosts in this novel. The ghost, the ghost. I want to look at two illustrations. Uh, could, Jillian, Courtney, could you put up the ghost walk illustration? I promised I would talk about illustrations a little bit. And what is the relationship between um, illustrator and author? And we, we do have uh, some information about uh, the relationship between Dickens and Fizz. Fizz was a younger uh, man. Uh, he took instruction from Dickens. Dickens told him which scenes in the novel he wanted to have illustrated. Um, we don't have all of the correspondence between Dickens and Fizz. We have uh, a good bit of correspondence for Dombey and Son, because Dickens was writing Dombey and Son when he was in Paris and in Italy, or in Paris and in Switzerland, um, and so they couldn't uh, uh, speak to each other. We don't have much information about Bleak House. We don't know what instructions Dickens gave to, uh, to Fizz. But we do know that Dickens selected the scenes that he wanted illustrated and um, sometimes was not happy with the design that Fizz gave him and asked him to make changes. So we can assume that uh, it's, it's a reasonable assumption that the illustrations reflect both the intention of Fizz and the intention of Dickens, the author. But I want to ask a slightly different question. And the question is, we, we're reading a novel in which there are two narrators. One of them is Esther, and the other is the omniscient third person narrator. Who narrates the illustrations? That is, who sees them? And what I want to propose is that the illustrations that correspond to passages in Esther's narrative are seen by Esther. That this is what Esther sees. It's the ghost walk as seen by Esther, as seen by Esther when in the day that 
days that follow the revelation about who her mother is, Esther goes and physically walks on the ghost walk. Esther becomes the ghost at that point. I think this is a picture of the ghost walk as seen by Esther when she is walking on the ghost walk. One reason I think that is that Esther describes seeing a light in the window. And this illustration shows a light in the window. I think this is Esther walking on the ghost walk as a ghost, seeing a light in the window, which is the light where, of the room where her mother is. So if you think of this both as a memory remembered by Esther retrospectively, but also as experienced by Esther, the character, during her actual walk on the ghost walk. It has that double significance. Show the next illustration, which is from the same chapter. These are from the Chesney Wall chapter 36. This is an illustration. The title is Lady Deadlock in the Wood. Um, for me, this is one of the most important illustrations in the entire novel. There are three figures in the novel. To the left is Lady Deadlock, who is running or uh, has been, has run toward and is reaching out with her open arms toward Esther, who is seated on a bench underneath the tree. And in the background is Charlie, who is gathering flowers, we're told in Esther's narrative. There's a tree. There's a tree branch in the foreground. This illustration, I think, is also seen by Esther or remembered by Esther from her position as the retrospective narrator. As in many of the illustrations, Esther's face is not visible. We see Lady Dedlock's face and we know that Lady Dedlock's face is a mirror image of Esther's face. But this is Esther after she has had the disease, after her face has been disfigured. So we don't see Esther's face. Esther's face is the secret of the novel. But if we look at the third figure in this illustration in the background of Charlie gathering flowers, her face is not visible either. There's a way in this novel in which all of the women's faces begin to blend into the same face. Charlie's face, Caddy's face, Ada's face, Hortense's face, Lady Dedlock's face are all versions of Esther's face. So what is this an illustration of? It's, it's an illustration of the reunion between Esther and her mother. Her mother with open arms ready to embrace her. But we know from the letter and from Esther's account of her conversation with Esther that Lady Dedlock says to her, I am your mother, but we can never speak again. You must henceforth consider me as dead. So the reunion scene between Lady Dedlock and Esther is in fact not a reunion, but a rejection. Lady Dedlock announces that she is Esther's mother and then says, you must evermore consider me as dead. So it's a, re a, a repetition of Esther's worst fear namely that her mother does not love her, rejects her. In the background is Charlie gathering flowers. But I think it's also a Lady Deadlock figure and that what it's not Charlie gathering flowers, but it's Lady Deadlock burying the dead child. I think this is Esther's fantasy of the two mothers 
that she had. One who is loving and kind and ready to embrace her, and another who hates her, who's ashamed of her, who doesn't want her alive, and who buried her. Which is the true story? Esther, Esther carries both stories in her head. Um, which, which is the true story? Lady Dedlock tells the story, probably the true story, um, but this is a novel about maternal rejection, about, about the daughter who must try and win some love to herself, as she says, who feels that she is unloved, unworthy, whose only way of being in the world is to be that goody, goody, duty, 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 uh, jingle the housekeeping keys, um, uh, uh, to be a, a mother to every uh, child that she encounters in the novel, particularly neglected children, um, because she has no mother for herself. So this, this illustration, I think, um, whether intended or not, I, 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 I can't, I won't go so far as to say that Dickens gave this instruction to, to, to Fizz and told him to represent this, but I think the two of them collaboratively have produced an image which is the, um, one of the, the most complex and troubling images of a mystery, a secret, the secret that is Esther, the secret that is Esther's face, a, a, a secret that is hidden from us as readers, and in this illustration, hidden from us as viewers as well. So th that's, that's an interpretation that uh, uh, I, I, I propose as speculative, but I think it's consistent with the psychological, even psychoanalytic reading. And it goes back to the passage that I first read to you because it depends on or is connected to Esther's realization that um, uh, Lady Dedlock is her mother prior to the illness that produces the disfigurement. So take the illustration down and I'll ask for comments. So uh, uh, Glenna first, Michael uh, second. Oh, this is, the discussion is absolutely wonderful. I wanted to bring back the whole issue of Esther's looks because in her narration, she's always talking about how she's kind of plain. She's, you know, and she accepts the label of Dame Durden and she's just, um, you know, uh, she's not beautiful like Ada, but yet she looks like her mother and her mother is this incredible most, beauty. The most beautiful woman in England. Yeah, and so, I mean, the only way we begin to get that Esther is lovely herself is Guppy's initial reaction to her, where he immediately, you know, is interested in her. And so I think that her downplaying her own beauty is part, it feeds right into what you're saying, John, about the psychoanalytic uh, interpretation and all the complexities that, um, you know, in downplaying her own physical attractiveness, she's somehow um, trying to uh, bury the doll in, in some very profound way. She's hiding from us and she's hiding from herself. Uh, she doesn't want to look at herself in the mirror unless she sees either an image of a little old lady, the Dame Durden figure. She's hiding her beauty from herself. She's hiding her beauty from us. Remember the first illustration of the novel, which is of the little old lady, um, Miss Flight, and Esther is standing between Ada to her right and Miss Flight to her left, and she's turning toward Miss Flight. Those are two mirrors. Esther wants to be Miss Flight, the little old lady. She doesn't want to acknowledge, she can't acknowledge her, her beauty. Um, she can't see herself as Ada. And then she develops what she calls a horror of herself, 
because if she were to acknowledge that she is Lady Dedlock's daughter, it would be the death of Lady Dedlock. So Esther is a ghost. She's dead psychically. Lady Dedlock is dead from the beginning. She is also a ghost. There are many ghosts in this, in this novel. Um, Esther is uh, dead and then comes back from the dead to haunt Lady Dedlock. Lady Dedlock is my mama, did my mama die on my birthday? Comes back from the dead to haunt Esther. They're haunting each other. Michael. Oh, um, there's another unusual thing about that illustration, which you mentioned but didn't comment on, which is the broken branch in the foreground. There, you could say a lot about trees in this novel. Um, and, you know, the broken branch, it's, it's the broken parent-child relationship, among other things. But, you know, the, the, there's this, you know, huge, vibrant tree in the background. But, it, but it, all the language about trees and about Chesney Gould is about death and about dying trees. And, you know, the, 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 the weather in Lincolnshire is always terrible. And all the, but again, some, I mean, why would you put a dead branch in the front, in the foreground of this illustration unless Fizz and Dickens talked about it. I, I, you know, it just seems that it has to represent the broken, the notion of broken relationships in a parent to child. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if you go back and look at the scene in which Esther buries her doll, where does she bury her doll? It's underneath a tree. So I, I think this scene is a recapitulation of the the scene of burying the doll, which is the recapitulation of Esther's fantasy about maternal rejection, which is the, the secret that we didn't know we were looking for. Um, um, so what is Esther going to do now? Um, you know, where will Esther go with, with this knowledge? So Wayne and then Phyllis. Michael touched on my point. I'm fascinated by that huge tree behind them. And Fizz needs it to fill that space with design. But I'm wondering if that tree doesn't have a further symbolic value. I agree with the branch and the point that Michael made. But uh, I think the tree is more than that. <laughs> it's, can we, can we make a very bad pun and say it's the family tree? Yeah, well, that's one uh, thing I think. Definitely. <laughs> Phyllis. And I, 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 um, have, I, have, I have one more. Oh, did you have something further, Wayne? OK, Phyllis. Uh, well, I just uh, now I have to put this in because I was trying to figure out what this meant. When Bagnet uh, starts the uh, birthday party for the old lady, his wife, the only birthday they celebrate, uh, he is the lignum vitae, the tree of life. So. <laughs> Please help me with that, John. <laughs> I think you've done it. I think you've done it. Um, um, and there, there are more, there are more secrets. I mean, we we have not exhausted the secrets in in, in this book. Uh, but I'll make one connection uh, to uh, a character we discussed earlier, and that's Mr. Snagsby. Mr. Snagsby is someone who has a secret, <laughs> um, except he doesn't know what the secret is. Uh, uh, he, he thinks he must have a secret because his wife is suspicious. And so he wanders around feeling guilty or feeling perplexed that he is a secret. And I think Mr. Snagsby is the comic version of Esther, that Esther is walking around with a secret that she doesn't know or doesn't fully understand. And she is the secret. The secret is, is Esther. And everybody else is figuring out what the relationship between Esther and Lady Dedlock is. But that's not the secret. The secret is that Esther can't understand the significance of that for her, which is, again, that she is dead. Um, so. I have one more passage that I want to discuss with you, and I haven't uh, asked Courtney and Jillian to prepare this, but I'm, I'm going to 
read it to you. And you, you may remember that at the end of the chapter uh, 36, that in, in which um, Lady Dedlock reveals herself to Esther as Esther's mother, and that contains the two illustrations that I just showed you, the ghost walk and Lady Dedlock in the wood. Um, there's another important event that happens and it's uh, that Esther and Ada get to see each other for the first time since Esther has been ill. And Esther is very worried about what Ada's reaction will be. And you remember, because of social distancing in a time of plague, time of pandemic, Esther has not permitted Ada to come into the room where she, in, into the sick room. Charlie has been there because Charlie has had the fear and Charlie um, is therefore, has, is immune. Um, but Ada has been prohibited. So Esther has now recovered. And she worries about what Ada's reaction will be. And she's, her worry manifests itself first in wanting to see Ada. And she runs down the lane. She runs outside the house down the lane toward where Ada is coming. And then she worries that Ada um, may have a different reaction. And so she runs back and hides in the room. And that back and forth is Esther's ambivalence, uncertainty about, about whether Ada will still love her now that she is disfigured. And here's the description of the reunion. Um, at last, when I believe there was at least a quarter of an hour more yet, Charlie all at once cried out to me as I was trembling in the garden. Here she comes, miss. Here she is. And this is the arrival of, of Ada. I did not mean to do it, but I ran upstairs into my room and hid myself behind the door. There I stood trembling, even where I heard, when I heard my, dar my darling calling as she came upstairs. Esther, my dear, my love, where are you? Little woman, dear Dame Durden. Those, those names, those offensive names. She ran in and was running out again when she saw me. Ah, my angel girl, the old dear look, all love, all fondness, all affection, nothing else in it. No, nothing, nothing. Oh, how happy I was down upon the floor with my sweet, beautiful girl down upon the floor too, holding my scarred face to her lovely cheek bathing it with tears and kisses, rocking me to and fro like a child, calling me by every tender name that she could think of and pressing me to her faithful heart. Lady Dedlock has just rejected Esther. You, hi, I'm your mother. You must, we must never speak. You must ever more consider me as dead. Esther fears that she's unlovable. She fears that Ada will not love her. But Ada has the reaction, exactly the reaction that Esther wanted. Ada here is a kind of doll figure who's playing the role of Esther's mother, embracing her, bathing her in kisses, rolling with her on the floor. People have, some people have suggested that this is a homoerotic, scene of, of lesbian attraction between Esther and, and Ada. Um, I think it is love, certainly, but I think it's, it's the reenactment of the scene of maternal embrace that Esther longs for. She longs to be loved by the mother figure. So Ada here is cast in the role of mother giving Esther exactly the reaction that Ada, that Esther wants. Except there's something troubling here. And I want to read again the paragraph. 
She ran in and was running out again when she saw me. Ah, my angel girl, the old dear look, all love, all fondness, all affection, nothing else in it. No, nothing, nothing. And I think that word nothing echoes back to the opening paragraph of chapter three of the novel, where Esther is looking at the doll and the doll is looking at Esther or not so much at me as at nothing. Nothing is Esther's identity. And Ada, at the same time that she is giving her all the love and affection, um, uh, rocking me to and fro like a child, calling me by every tender name that she could think of and pressing me to her faithful heart. At the same time, Esther is seeing nothing. Ada is seeing nothing, nothing. That, that word that haunts Esther and that I think is the nothingness that links her to Nemo, that links her to her fantasy of unworthiness, um, to her feeling that she's unlovable. And another word in this passage that is I think crucial is pressing me to her faithful heart. Um, Ada is pressing Esther to her faithful heart. Lady Dedlock is not the faithful mother. Lady Dedlock is the unfaithful mother. And if you go back and look at the opening paragraph of, this, I think it's the second paragraph of chapter three, when Esther is talking about the doll. She says, dear faithful dolly, faithfulness is another important theme in this novel. Loyalty, people who are loyal to each other and betrayal. And Esther is suffering from betrayal by her mother. The betrayal that takes place in what should be the reunion scene that's reenacted and corrected here with Ada, but with that troubling word, nothing. Robert, you have a hand up and then it's almost time for us to end. Yeah, I just wanted to say in, in closing that um, on January 23rd, everybody will have access to the Bleak House musical, uh, mm -hmm. which is three hours and the, and the and the script and everything else that goes along with it. So I didn't want to spoil uh, people who have not finished the novel, but that is something I want them to look forward to. And all the members will be able to email, email me, uh, you know, reactions, criticisms, uh, suggestions to their heart's content, because I know uh, most, most of the members feel like two hours is, is just barely scratching the surface. So they'll get as much time as they want. Okay, we have something to look forward to in January. We will finish Bleak House. Uh, no more restrictions on passages that we can't talk about. Um, and thank you for listening. And um, I hope you have good holidays. And I will see you in January. Bye-bye. So,